when she said that, the girl's eyes seemed to be saying, "Dummy, dummy." They came to a raised path between the rice paddies. They passed people harvesting early rice. They found the scarecrow. The boy shook the straw ropes holding it up. Some sparrows flew away. He thought, "Oh, I really ought to go home early today and keep the sparrows out of the field next to the house." Oh, what fun! The girl took hold of the lines on the scarecrow and shook them. The scarecrow swayed and danced. The dimples were subtly outlined on the girl's left cheek. A little farther on stood another scarecrow. The girl ran over to it. The boy ran behind her, as if trying to forget that on a day like this he ought to go home early and help with the chores. He brushed past the girl and kept running. The grasshoppers flying against him made his face sting. The autumn sky, a deep indigo, spun before the boy's eyes. He was dizzy. It was because of that eagle, that eagle, that eagle circling up there in the sky. He looked back and saw the girl shaking a scarecrow. It was dancing even more than the first one. At the end of the rice paddies, they came to a ditch. The girl ran there first and jumped across. From there to the base of the hill, there were only a few farm fields. They passed some sorghum fields where harvested shocks were standing. What's that? A watchman's hut. Are the melons here good? Sure, the melons are good, but the watermelons are even better. I wish I could eat one. The boy went into a melon field that had been second cropped in radishes and pulled up two big daikon radishes. They weren't quite fully grown. After twisting off the leaves and throwing them down, he handed her one of the radishes. Then, as if to show her how they were eaten, he bit off the top. Scraped away a ring of the skin with his fingernail and began to crunch it. The girl did the same. By the third bite, though, she said, "Oh, it's too hot and it stinks." She spat it out and threw the rest away. It tastes awful. I can't eat it. He flung his radish even farther away. The hill drew closer. The autumn leaves on the hill stood out vividly. Oh, look! The girl ran in the direction of the hill. This time, the boy did not run after her, but soon he had picked more flowers than she had. And what are those yellow flowers that look like parasols? These are wild chrysanthemums. These are bush clover. These are bluebells. I didn't know bluebells were so pretty. I like purple anyway. Then, what are those yellow flowers that look like parasols? Wild parsley. The girl held up a flower the way you would hold a parasol. This brought out the delicate dimples on the girl's slightly flushed face. Once more, the boy picked a handful of flowers and brought them over to the girl. He picked out the freshest among them and handed them to her. She said, "Don't throw any of them away." They walked up the ridge to the crest of the hill. Over in the opposite valley, several thatched farm houses were gathered into a cozy little hamlet. Neither suggested it, but they sat down side by side astride the big boulder. The surroundings seemed to become especially hushed. The autumn sunlight filled the. The surroundings seemed to become especially hushed. The autumn sunlight filled the air with the fragrance of drying grasses and leaves. What are those flowers up there? On a rather steep slope nearby, flowers hung from a tangled arrowroot vine. They look like wisteria. There used to be a big wisteria arbor at our school in Seoul. When I see those flowers, it makes me think of the times I used to spend with my friends under the wisteria arbor. 
The girl rode slowly and went over to the slope. She backed down on her hands and knees, and began to tug on the vine that had the most blossoms hanging from it. It hardly moved as she pulled. She tried to check herself, but began to slide. She held on to the arrowroot vine. The boy jumped up and ran to her. The girl put out her hand, and as the boy pulled her up, he thought that he should have offered to pick the flowers. Beads of blood began to form on the girl's right knee. Without thinking, the boy put his lips on the scratch and began to suck away the blood. Then suddenly he thought of something, jumped up and ran off. In a short while, the boy returned, out of breath, and said, "If you rub this on, it'll get better." The boy dabbed some pine resin on the scratch, and then he went down to the place where the arrowroot vines were growing. With his teeth, he tore off several of the vines with the most blossoms and climbed back up with them. After this, he said, "There's a calf over there. Let's go see it." The calf was a light yellowish color. It still did not have the ring put through its nose. The boy grasped the tether close to the calf's head, acted as if he were about to scratch its back, then lightly jumped up and mounted it. The calf began to bug and circle. The girl's white face, pink sweater, dark blue skirt, and the flowers she was holding in her arms all swirled into one blur. It looked like one great bunch of flowers. Oh, I'm dizzy! But he didn't want to get off. He was feeling proud of himself. Here was one thing he could do that the girl couldn't imitate. He thought. What's going on here? A farmer appeared, coming up through the tall reeds. The boy jumped down from the calf. Now all this would end up with a scolding, with the farmer saying, "You ought to know you will hurt the back of such a small calf if you try to ride it." But the farmer, who had a long beard, glanced in the direction of the girl, untied the tether of the calf, and said to them, "You'd better hurry home. It's about to rain." Sure enough, a black storm cloud was directly overhead. All at once, loud noise seemed to be coming from every direction. The wind rose and swooshed around. In a moment, everything around them turned purple. As they came down the hill, they heard the sound of rain drops on the leaves of the oak tree. They were big drops of rain. They felt the cold on the back of their necks. Then suddenly there was a cloudburst that at once blinded their view. In the dense downpour, they saw the little watchman's hut. It was the only place to take cover from the rain. The stilts under the little hut were leaning askew, and the thatched roof had separated in several places. Such as it was, the boy found the spot where the rain was leaking in less badly, and had the girl go inside and wait there. The girl's lips began to turn a blotch blue color, and her shoulders kept shaking and shaking. The boy took off his cotton jacket and put it around the girl's shoulders. The girl raised her drenched eyes and looked at the boy. The boy stood there silently. Then she removed the flowers with broken stems and wilted blossoms from the bunch she had been carrying in her arms and dropped them by her feet. The rain began to lick in where the girl was standing. It was impossible to stay out of the rain there any longer. The boy looked outside, then thought of something and ran over toward the sorghum field. He pulled open one of the tall sheaves standing in the field, then brought several more nearby sheaves and stood them against it. He looked inside once again, then looked toward the hut and beckoned. The rain did not leak into the tall sorghum sheaves, but it was dark and the space was too small. The boy sitting in front of the girl was partly exposed to the rain. Vapor was now rising from the boy's shoulders. In a near whisper, the girl said, "Come in and sit here." "I'm all right," she said once again. 
Come in and sit down. He had back in. When he did, he crushed the bunch of flowers the girl was holding, but she did not seem to mind. The odor of the boy's rain soaked body suddenly hit her nostrils, but she did not turn her head away. Instead, she began to feel the vigor of the boy's body infuse her shivering frame with its warmth. At always, the sound on the leaves of the sorghum shocks stopped. Outside, it began to turn brighter. They came out of their shelter in the tall shocks. Ahead on the path, the blinding sunlight was already pouring down. When they came to the place where they had crossed the ditch, they found it had swollen beyond the recognition. The color had changed, and it had turned into a rushing, muddy river. It would be impossible now to jump across. The boy turned and offered his back. The girl calmly climbed onto his back to be carried across. The water came up over his rolled-up shorts. The girl cried out, "Oh my!" and held on tightly around the boy's neck. Before they had reached the opposite bank, the autumn sky had cleared and was in its glory as never before. A high, deep blue dome without a speck of cloud to be seen. After that day, the girl was nowhere to be seen. Every day, the boy would run to the place by the side of the stream, but could never find her. The boy even watched the school playground during recess hours. He began to spy furtively on the girl's fifth-grade class, but he did not see her. Then one day. As usual, the boy went down to the bank of the stream, fingering the little white stone he still carried in his pocket. And look, wasn't that the girl sitting on the dike on this side of the stream? The boy's heart began to thump. I've been sick since I saw you. The girl's face seemed to have turned a much paler color. Is it because you were caught in the rain that day? She quietly nodded her head. "Are you all better now?" "Well, I'm still." She trailed off and did not finish. "Then you ought to be lying down and resting." "I came out because I was so bored. Oh, that day was so much fun, you know. I got a stain on my clothes that won't come out." The girl looked down at the bottom edge of her pink sweater. There was a dark reddish stain there, the color of muddy water, generally bringing to life her faint dimples. The girl said, "Where do you suppose this stain came from?" The boy stood looking intently at the hem of the sweater. "I think I know. Remember how you carried me on your back across the ditch that day? I picked up that stain from your back." The boy felt himself suddenly blushing. At the place where they took separate paths, the girl said, "Say, this morning we picked dates at our house. We're getting ready for the autumn sacrifice tomorrow." She held out a handful of dates. The boy hesitated. "Try them. They're very sweet. They say our great great grandfather planted the tree." Extending his cupped hands. The boy said, "They sure are big." Oh, and by the way, after the autumn moon sacrifice, we're going to move out of our house. Even before the girl and her family had moved in, the boy had heard the people in the village saying that Yun's grandson was coming back to the home village because the family had failed in business in Seoul and had no place else to go. Now, it looked as if they had lost the family homestead too. I don't know why, but now I don't want to move," the girl said. "The grown-ups have made the decision, so there isn't anything I can do about it. And yet," and she fell silent. For the first time, a lonesome look came into the girl's black eyes. On his way home, after he had left the girl. The boy kept thinking over and over about the girl's saying that she was going to move. Really, now 
There was no reason to feel sorry or sad about it. All the same, the boy paid no attention to the sweet taste of the dates he was eating. That night, the boy went secretly to the place where old grandfather Duxet's walnut trees grew. He climbed up in a tree he had spotted during the day, and then began to beat with a stick on the branch he had picked out. The sound of the walnut burrs falling seemed strangely loud. The noise made him tense, afraid of being discovered. Then, in the next instant, without knowing just why, he summoned all his strength and beat furiously with a stick, saying, "Come on, big ones, fall! You have to." A lot of you have to fall. On the way back home, he felt his way carefully, staying in the shadows cast by the three-quarter moon. It was the first time he had ever felt thankful for the shadows. The boy ran his hands over his bulging pockets. It didn't bother him at all that people say you can get a bad itch from shaking the birds from walnuts with your bare hands. The walnuts from Grandfather Duxue's house were supposed to be the best ones in the area. The boy's only thought was that he must get some to the girl right away for her to try. But then, oh no, he had completely forgotten to ask her to come down to the bank of the stream once more if she got better before they moved away. What a dummy he was! Dummy. The next day, the boy came home from school to find his father dressed in his best clothes, holding a chicken. He asked his father where he was going. Without responding to the boy's question, the father estimated the weight of the chicken he was holding and said, "Suppose this is big enough." Bringing out a net bag, his mother said. "You're taking the one that has already cackled several days and." Is about to start laying. She's not all that big yet, but I guess she's heavy enough. The boy asked his mother this time where his father was going. Oh, he's going to Yun's house over in the schoolhouse valley. It's something for them to put with their sacrifice. Then you should send the big one, like the speckled rooster over there. The boy's father laughed at this and said. Come on, son. This one will be fine. Suddenly, the boy felt ashamed. He threw down his school books and went over to the oxygen stall. He gave the ox a slap on the back, making it look as though he was swatting a fly. Day by day, the water in the stream flowed in its course, and the autumn deepened. The boy went to the fork in the road and looked down the lower way. Beyond the end of the reed fields, the village and schoolhouse valley appeared unusually close under the indigo sky. People in the village had been saying that tomorrow the girl's family would be moving to the town of Yangpyeong. It seemed they planned to try running a little store there. Unconsciously, the boy was fingering the shelled walnuts in his pocket with one hand, and with the other. Was bending and breaking off red tassels one after another. That night, as he lay in bed, the boy had only one thought on his mind: Should I go tomorrow and watch when the girl's family is moving? If I go, will I get to see the girl? What should I do? Then he wasn't quite sure whether he had already been asleep when he heard. Ah,、uh, well, that's really strange. His father, who had been over at the village, had come back, and it's really terrible. All that's happened to the Yun family. First, they had to sell all their paddies and fields. Then they saw the house they've lived in for generations pass into someone else's hands, and now, think of it. On top of all that, they have to suffer this kind of cruel death. The boy's mother, who sat doing mending in her lap by the light of the lamp, said, "Was that girl the only great grandchild they had?" "That's right. The two boys they had died when they were still small." "I wonder 
why they've had such bad luck with the children in their family," said his mother. "I wonder," answered his father. "With this child, the sickness lasted a long time, and I hear they couldn't afford to give her the right medicine. The way it is now, the Yun's family line is finished. This girl seems to have been precocious for her age, though." You know, she said that if she died, she wanted them to bury her just as she was, right in the clothes she was wearing.